Thank you. Well, I can't imagine um, any better city in the world to hold a resilience conference and workshop. I think uh, Katrina was the wake-up call to the world that preparedness, urban preparedness, was something that is critical going forward for city planners, um, city builders, politicians, environmentalists to be thinking about. So I have 30 minutes to um, give you some sense of what resilience is, um, to give you some sense of what's taken me four or five years to glean. So I'm going to be going at a very high level. I'm going to be around for the next two days, um, circulating between tables, so that uh, if you've missed anything or I haven't been clear enough, please feel free to uh, grab me and ask me questions. So first of all, I think over the last 20 or 30 years, the discourse about sustainability, environmentalism, has been very much about what we as a species are doing to our planet, the kind of harm we're causing through pollution, through CO2 emissions, etc. But very recently, um, there's another discourse that's been evolving, and that is the discourse of the actual impacts that we've had on our planet are starting to have reverberations and impacts back on us. And those impacts are being felt um, in our cities, uh, in our rural um, communities, everywhere around the world. And so to come to terms with that, not only do we have to be thinking about how we can continue to reduce the harm we're doing as a species to the planet, but also at the same time, how we're going to deal with the impacts that the world is now having back upon us. So I think that the discourse now going forward is a reciprocal discourse. It's a discourse about reducing harm at the same time as understanding how we will build resilience to those shocks and stresses that we will be continuing and continue with greater frequency and intensity to experience um, in the future. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. Um, to put this in some kind of larger context, um, I think what we um, exist in today um, in our cities and our communities are what I refer to as the carbon city. Um, the city where most of our energy is carbon-based, most of our production um, using, uses fuels and materials that are carbon-based. And over the next uh, 20, 30 years, we have to figure out how to get from being carbon-based um, to non-carbon-based. So we can become a, from, go from being carbon cities to regenerative cities, repairing some of the damage we've already done to our ecosystems, to our planet. And hopefully, the end state of all of this is what I would call a symbiotic city, where we're no longer parasites on our planet, but we're actually symbionts. Um, we give back as much as we take. And that's some ways off. But in the meantime, and where resilience fits in, I think, is that we have to hold the fort. That there's going to be a lot of shocks and stresses coming back to us from the damage we've already done. So we're going to have to start to build resilience into our communities and to our cities. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about uh, in this 30 minutes. And what you're going to be doing, the very hard work over the next two days, although I think it's going to be a lot of fun, um, in starting to make sense of in the context of North America. So first of all, um, what is resilience? I'm going to be talking about attributes of resilience, the six key drivers of shocks and stresses, and what some of those shocks and stresses are going to be. I'm going to talk at a very high level because of the time constraint, but I think um, it will be worthwhile for your workshop over the next couple of days. So what is resilience? Um, common uh, definition uh, by, uh, say, dictionary.com would be resilience is the power, ability to return to original form, position, etc., after being bent, compressed, stretched, or elasticity. elasticity. Think of a, a rubber band. Um, or the ability to recover readily from illness, depression, adversity, or the like, buoyancy. So I think both of those are actually quite applicable when you think of cities. But, but the, the term that um, um, I've come to, or the definition I've come to, to use is the one based on C.S. Hollings. He's an environmentalist, or I should say an ecologist, um, and really started in the 70s to understand resilience of ecosystems. Um, and we've worked over the last uh, uh, three or four years to develop a definition that seemed to make sense for um, um, the urban 
situation. That is, resilience is the capacity of a community's economic, social, political, and physical infrastructure systems to absorb shocks and stresses and still retain their basic function and structure. Um, now, interestingly, Thomas Homer Dixon, um, one of the um, uh, more thoughtful writers on resilience um, and, and resource issues in, in his book, The Upside of Down, recently, um, made the point that resilience is an emergent property of a system. It's a, a gestalt. And the problem with that, um, as he says, it's not the result of any one of the system's parts, but of the synergy between all of its parts. So the big problem with resilience then is, unlike measuring the amount of CO2 we're putting in the atmosphere, you can't measure resilience until after the fact. You can't measure how resilient a community was, how resilient a city was, until after an impact, a shock, a stress has happened, and then you can see how resilient it is. What you, what you can do is start to put in place strategies and approaches that will build resilience. So resilience to which shocks and stresses? Which are the important shocks and stresses that we have to be thinking about as we look at building, shock, building resilience in our communities? Um, this is the last list of what I call the big 10. I won't dwell on these. I think they're, they're, they're shocks and stresses that have occurred through time. Um, and as we go forward in the future, what we'll be seeing is, depending on the kind of drivers that I'll, I'll be talking about, some will be uh, more present and others less. But economic shocks and stresses, environmental, energy supply, price shocks, uh, infrastructure failures, um, uh, think of what happened in Katrina, population change and migrations, food shortages, price shocks, um, severe weather events, disease, pandemics, um, regional resource conflicts, um, terrorism, bio, cyber, dirty nukes, etc. So that's the sort of list of the kind of shocks and stresses that cities and communities might face. Um, and the, the key here when we're talking about building resilience is to understand the drivers of, of these shocks and stress. What, what is behind producing these shocks and stresses? Well, I think there are six key drivers. First is climate change. Um, and second is population growth and migration. Third is energy supply. And by this, I don't mean peak oil. It's all things related to getting energy from one, creating it, getting it from one point to another. Um, environmental degradation, resource uh, conflicts between regions, and of course, socio-political uh, conflicts. Um, and I'd like to spend a little bit of uh, time on these two because I think going forward, these will probably be the most important drivers of shocks and stresses to our communities and cities over the next 25 years. And these are the ones that we'll have to be looking at building resilience strategies and approaches for to make our cities and our communities more resilient. So climate change, um, all of you are aware that uh, we have a problem with carbon dioxide production. Um, since the Industrial Revolution, we've been continuing to pump more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This is not new news. Um, but I can tell you that as of yesterday, nothing has changed on this. Um, and of course, as you know, the carbon dioxide um, concentration in the atmosphere has a um, corollary of uh, driving temperatures up on average across the planet. So um, th this, is, this is something that is, is, has not changed over the last 10 years. Um, all of the uh, attempts at uh, finding ways to reduce carbon dioxide through efficiency, um, through um, legislation, have not had any um, discernible impact on the amount of carbon dioxide being generated. And as you can see, temperatures following them up. And looking forward, unless, there, unless something changes, and I think there are some opportunities for change, um, carbon dioxide production will continue um, to not only um, increase but accelerate. The, the blue line up here is um, uh, the United States carbon dioxide production and the red is China. China is very quickly catching up the United States and the rest of the lines below um, are the rest of the major industrial countries in the world. So what I would like to do, you're all very familiar with climate change, I would like to give you some sense 
of one of the really key things that's going to drive um, shocks and stresses as a result of climate change. And this is the impact that climate will have on agriculture. Um, and as you are well aware, um, there are two bands of desert around the world, and these are caused by what are called the Hadley cells at about 25 degrees altitude on either side, uh, or I should say latitude on either side of the equator. Um, and these are caused by the hot, moist air rising up from the equator, um, equatorial regions, dropping all of their moisture um, to create the rainforests of the world, and then coming back down to Earth. And as they come back down to Earth, they've lost their moisture, and as they come down, Boyle's law causes them to uh, increase in temperature, and they come down as very hot and dry air, causing the desertification um, of those bands. Um, climate scientists are predicting that as time goes on, and as we uh, increase the, the average temperature of the atmosphere, that these Hadley cells will tend to expand northward and southward. Um, and if you look at where they're expanding over, they're expanding over what are now the world's bread basket, the, where the world produces rice, corn, and wheat. And so that means that the, not only is the world's population increasing, but the number of arable um, acres to be able to produce food is decreasing. So whether this comes as gradual stress of decreasing numbers of arable um, acres of land or shocks when one particular ecosystem collapses and brings down um, production of grain or corn um, at some part of the world, they will, it will certainly be something that we'll be looking forward in the future to happening over the next 20, 25 years. So the second thing that is really worth considering when we talk about um, resilience is how population growth and migration are going to have an impact on cities in the future. Um, the good news is that the overall rate of population is falling. The bad news is that over the next 25 years, we will be adding 2 billion people to the planet. Um, and irrespective of the Hadley cells and climate change, that is going to drive um, demand on food um, and therefore the cost of food. And unless we can find ways to produce food um, in new ways and cost-effective ways, we're cities will be seeing both uh, stresses, long-term stresses, as well as particular shocks and stresses as price changes happen. Um, we're harvesting most of the big fish species out of the oceans. Um, the cod, the huge cod industry has collapsed in 1992, and there are a number of other major species that are headed for collapse over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, population migrations, um, as you're all very familiar, um, there are population moving across continents. But more interestingly, um, there's also what's called the third great migration of rural populations into cities. So we're going to be adding, um, over the next, by 2050, 2050, about 3.1 billion people to cities. So there's an there's a increase of 2 billion people, but there's actually a greater number coming to cities. So that in itself will be a stress, how we deal with it, um, how we make our cities more resilient to that, and actually potentially benefit from that, which I'll be talking about in the next presentation an hour from now, um, will be key. But interestingly, these, shock, these drivers um, are not separate from one another. They tend to multiply one another's effects, and they also tend to interact with another, one another. So that climate change will obviously have some impact on population migrations. It will have some impact on resource issues, um, and so forth. So how do we start to build capacity for resilience onto these future shocks and stresses? Um, I think there are six important attributes of resilience, and I'm getting a 15-minute time signal here, so it's going to be a little faster than I thought. Uh, key, flexibility, redundancy, diversity, decoupling, decentralization, and environmental integration. Um, flexibility is pretty obvious. Um, making our cities and our communities more flexible to, to change um, stresses 
um, will be key um, to building resilience. Redundancy is very important. Redundancy has been a dirty word over the last 20 years uh, in management and engineering circles. Just uh, think about how just-in-time um, manufacturing and product supply has been lauded as, as the way to build profit, uh, for example, in retail systems. But what happens if one point of that just-in-time um, network fails? The whole thing collapses. So having redundancy in, in cities, for example, say redundancy of water supply, redundancy of electrical power supply, is going to be very important for building re uh, re um, resiliency. Diversity. Think of the difference between the resiliency of a uh, monoculture, a cornfield, and a very rich ecosystem understory in a forest. Um, a bug, uh, a, a virus, a mold in a cornfield can wipe it out, whereas one in a, in a very rich ecosystem may harm a few plants, uh, but not hurt the overall ecosystem. So diversity in how our cities are construed and constructed, uh, the number of elements involved, think of you know, a big box, one big box store versus uh, many small retails. Um, certainly many small retail is going to be more diverse. Uh, decoupling, uh, following cars following too closely behind on a freeway and when someone hits the brakes, you've got a crash. The same thing happens with cities now, um, uh, very connected economically. Uh, one city somewhere, one community somewhere, fails, something goes wrong, it has ripple effect throughout. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that we should disconnect completely, but what it does mean is that we should be, build resilience into the fact that we're connected, so that if something happens somewhere else, that it doesn't ha cause complete um, uh, collapse uh, in, in the community that we're living in. And then decentralization, um, the classic starfish and the spider comparison, cut a leg of a starfish off, and what happens? Um, the uh, leg grows a new body and the body grows a new leg. Um, we're cut off the head of a spider and the spider dies. Uh, decentralization means that if one part of a community or city is affected, um, then the, the controls, the response, the ability for it to respond to that shock or stress is not completely destroyed. Um, and environmental integration. Um, understanding the environment that a community uh, resides in is very, very important. Failing to understand um, the real uh, implications of the environment that you're in, and of course this is in New Orleans after Katrina, is catastrophic. Okay, thank you very much. I, I, uh, I'm about to uh, present five opportunities for building resilience, and, and I'm standing here feeling quite humbled by the discussion I heard at my table, the kind of stories, the individual stories about people's experience with shocks and stresses in the world. And we had six at our table, and every single person had a significant encounter or experience with a shock or a stress that had significant impacts on their community. And so what I'd like to do is talk not about all of the ways that we can um, address the, the problem of shocks and stresses, or give you a compendium of, of resilience building tools, but just explore five approaches. Um, so the question to answer is, so how do we increase the resilience capacity of our communities and cities? Um, and I think there's a number of areas for building resilience. Um, and th these, again, th there are 10 of them, as it turns out. I think there's probably more, but these are the 10 big ones, I think, that are going to be important for us um, as um, uh, community leaders, uh, designers, and, and planners, and so forth. Um, one is public health. The area of public health is going to be critical to building resilience in communities. Education and training will be very important. Governance. Um, effective governance is a key criteria for building and maintaining resilience. Obviously, uh, the community and city's economy is going to be very important. A healthy economy immediately is a more resilient economy or city or a community than, a, than a, one with a um, uh, dysfunctioning economy. Uh, justice, public order, and security. Um, often these are the things talked about when people talk about resilience, uh, resilience to emergencies and so forth. But uh, they are important. Um, building fabric and transportation, the kind of shocks and stresses, the environmental ones like weather events and so forth, are going to be 
uh, having some real impact on building fabric and transportation, so building hardening and so forth will be important. Energy infrastructure is critical to the functioning of our communities and economies. Food production infrastructure is key. And um, communications and information technology infrastructure new in the last 10 years, but becoming absolutely essential for the functioning of our economies and culture. And then, of, co of course, water and waste infrastructure. So what I'd like to do is explore just uh, five of these. Let me get a glass of water here. Um, these are not the only ones or the most important ones, but they're ones that um, in our studio we've been exploring as um, uh, approaches that we think will add a lot to the resilience of cities and uh, in, in, in many cases communities that uh, make up the cities. So the first one raised by um, one of our uh, participants at, the f at my first presentation is growth and density. A lot of people think growth and density is a bad thing, um, but it's actually a very, very, in fact, I think one of the most important resilience building approaches that we have. Um, so if you were um, one of those people that think um, density is bad or um, growth of a, of a city or community is bad, I would ask you to think again. And here's why. First of all, um, population um, and immigration are things that we're going to be experiencing in the next 25 years that we've, the way we've never experienced before. 50% um, of the world's populations now live in cities. Um, or by 2050, 70 to 80% of um, the population will live in cities um, for two reasons. One is population growth itself within the cities, and the other is um, what Doug Saunders calls, the writer of a, the book called Arrival Cities, calls the third great migration. And this is the migration of rural peoples into cities. So like it or not, cities are going to become more populous and, um, if they're smart, denser. Um, so there are two very, very good things about this situation. I think a lot of people fear population growth and density. But there are two very good things, and here, here's what they are. First of all, um, a, a biologist by the name of Kleiber, uh, at the turn of the last century, was studying metabolism of animals, of mammals, and found that the larger the animal, um, the greater the mass of an animal, the lower its metabolic rate. And the metabolic rate is the rate at which um, the animal processes food. Um, the energy it expends per gram. Um, and it's not only lower, but it follows what uh, power law, the square root of the square root, so that the larger the animal, the lower the metabolic rate. Well, that's very interesting if you're a biologist. But interestingly, in the 1990s, um, a physicist by the name of Jeffrey West came along and started to see if this rule applied to anything else. And it turns out that it does. It applies to cities. That um, a city's metabolic rate, in other words, how much, it, how much energy it burns per um, capita, how, many, how much road it lays down per capita, how, many, how much pipe it has to manufacture per capita, all the things that burn energy and burn resources, um, the rate of burn goes down exponentially with the size of the city. That's very, very important. It means the larger and denser your city, the less per capita energy is consumed and materials are used. So in terms of resource efficiency and effectiveness, the bigger the city, the denser the city, the better. So here's the second very compelling thing about this. Um, West then went on to say, well, are there any other relationships that have to do with city size? And it turns out that as you increase the size of the city, you get an exponential growth in innovation. So that's why you see the biggest cities in the world tending to produce the most inventions, uh, the latest music, the, the latest art. Uh, West measured, for his measure, he took patents, and he measured patents in all the cities across the United States. And as you increase the city size, you increase the number of patents exponentially. So that means that as cities expand um, in size, 
They're going to be reducing the amount of energy per capita that they uh, use, which, good, which is good because think about energy is also in our present world carbon. So our carbon footprint per capita goes down with large cities. And when we're coming into a time of great stress where resilience will be needed, isn't it better that we're more innovative than not? Um, so how do we get there? I think high-rise density is something that we're going to have to learn how to do very well. Um, I think New York City and Vancouver are great examples in North America how to do this. Um, I think uh, as we start to transform our um, suburbs into denser um, habitation, that transit-oriented design is going to be an important strategy. And um, one of the most important questions is how um, uh, l less dense can we be and still be dense? Um, and that means what kind of density really will allow for the kind of efficiencies um, and sustainable kinds of infrastructure like um, LRTs um, and really good public transit. And our, there's a real discussion right now in planning circles about this, but somewhere in the order of 50 to 60 dwelling units per hectare um, is the kind of density that makes sense. And those are the, the densities that were around in the early 1920s and 30s for streetcar suburbs. Now, what's really interesting about this um, is that um, a writer uh, by the name of Ed Glazer, uh, an eco a Harvard economist um, who just finished um, writing a book called The Triumph of the City, which is really a great read, um, gave a sense of the kind of capacity that this would produce. If you took all of the people in the world, you could put all the people in the world in the state of Texas in that kind of habitation. So density is something that we want to look at as a tool for dealing with population. I've got 20, what, 20 minutes? OK, that's not too bad. Um, local, local low carbon energy. Um, why? Well, first of all, energy demand's going up. So as, as uh, the um, uh, countries like China in, uh, and India continue to increase their, their economic output, they'll be demanding more and more energy. North America will continue to demand a lot of energy. So we are going to be wanting to look at finding solutions to our problem with CO2. So low carbon energy is going to be key. Um, second of all, we have a problem right now with our um, electrical power infrastructure in North America, most of it in North America, um, Manitoba being an exception. Um, and uh, we're going to be looking for ways to make um, or, or build on existing infrastructure, redevelop infrastructure, and as we do, we're going to want to make it a low carbon infrastructure. And why? Because not only is pumping CO2 into the atmosphere a bad thing, as we move forward, there's a very good chance that um, carbon taxation um, and some accounting of carbon will be kicking in. So communities that start to build low carbon energy sources will probably have a better chance down the road of being economically successful and resilient than those that don't. So how do we do it? Well, um, the first really good piece of news is that zero carbon energy is nearing net parity. And by net parity, I mean the cost of coal is the bottom line. If we can't get zero carbon energy below the cost of coal, the game is over. Because coal is very, very cheap uh, per kilowatt hour. Um, uh, and about 90 cents, and as a result, um, no one is going, no city nor community is going to move away from that um, if they have to pay a lot more for it. But right now, PV, photovoltaics, is somewhere around five years away from net parity. That's not too bad. Um, and uh, you, you've got a sort of a, a comparison of, of various uh, costs here, conventional coal being $100 per uh, megawatt, and PV getting down to that over the next five years. Um, but the problem with both um, PV and wind is the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. And the storing the power for that intermittent phenomena is very important. And up until now, there really hasn't been much in the way of battery technology that's going to work. But right now, there is, over the next five, ten years, um, the explorations of liquid metal batteries is one example. There are a couple of others that will actually boost the power density 
of batteries by some, the power of 10. So, so that means that all of a sudden we will be able to harness the energy and store it from PV and wind power in an economically effective way. But I think more important and most controversial is uh, nuclear power. How many of you have um, some ambivalence about nuclear power? Hands up. Okay. Um, and uh, so you probably should. Um, the power, nuclear power of the past was based on uranium. Um, and uranium had two goals. One was to produce um, uh, power, but the other was to produce plutonium so we could make um, atom bombs and hydrogen bombs um, in the Cold War. Well, there was, a, this is a, 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 a nuclear plant in China, a can-do plant, um, using Canadian technology that, that our country really isn't pursuing anymore, uh, but China certainly is, as is India, because it is starting, um, uh, or the, they are starting to use thorium nuclear. And thorium, um, unlike uranium, is much richer in energy and also much less expensive and the waste products from it are much less harmful. They have half-lives of in the hundreds of years as opposed to thousands of years and it's very, very difficult to make nuclear weapons from them. That's why um, the, um, the Allies in the Second World War stayed away from it because it was too difficult to make a bomb out of thorium, whereas with, you could, you could uh, uh, process uranium to make plutonium very easily. So here's the kind of metrics that there are. A ton of thorium can produce as much energy as 200 tons of uranium or 3.5 million tons of coal. Um, and this kind of power over the probably the next five to 10 years has the potential to um, meet or go below the cost of, of coal. Um, and, if, and if fourth generation nuclear, and this is one of a couple of types of fourth generation nuclear is real, it is probably the answer to our, our car carbon problem. Um, much as it's very controversial, I think it's something you want to consider in the future when you hear about it. Um, the third one is local food production. Um, why do we want to consider local food production? Because as we increase the number of people on the planet and potentially decrease the number of arable acres of land on the planet, we're going to have to look for solutions to food. Um, also, as we face disruptions in um, uh, potentially in transportation and power supply and so forth, we're going to want to build resilience into our local food supply systems because to survive we need um, two things. We need water and we need food. So making sure that our communities and cities have some sort of resilient food supply is very important. This doesn't mean growing all of our own food in the city, but basically having a resilient food supply. So, Remember the Hadley cells? Um, this is going to be one of the main uh, culprits of uh, causing uh, food shocks and stresses in the future. Um, and so we're going to want to look at how to build resilience to that. So how do we do it? Well, right across North America right now, um, there is a, a debate going on in municipalities about whether or not you can have chickens in your backyard. Um, do, in, in your municipality, do you have the chicken debate going on? Hands up. Yeah, okay, everywhere. Um, so um, whether or not you are going to be allowed to have chickens on, in your backyard is really not going to solve the problem of local food. It's simply not scalable. You get one chicken per, uh, sorry, one egg per chicken per day um, unless things get fouled up um, and then you have less. So it just doesn't scale. The reality is that the amount of land required, typical arable land, um, Per person in North America is about two acres per person for an omnivore. Um, it's less for uh, vegetarians. Um, in Toronto, that means six million acres. We don't have six million acres of land um, around, uh, in Toronto, and most cities right now have paved over their, their arable land to put up suburbs. And in, in Canada, at least, we have winter, so we, don't, we have six months of the year where we can't grow um, anything anyway. So what do we do? Well, I think the the a solution or a strategy that um, cities are going to want to explore and communities are going to want to explore is vertical food production. Um, in fact, uh, we have in the room Gordon Graff over there. He's one of um, uh, the world's experts in, in vertical food production. 
Um, and what this talks about, and this is his, his, uh, his idea for how you could, on a very large scale in a city, have uh, integration with uh, food distribution um, and food production. And what it's all about is basically hydroponic um, food production. The efficiency of this kind of food is 50 times um, the um, level of land food production. So for every meter of, of um, uh, hydroponic uh, floor plate here, you would have to have uh, 50 square meters of typical arable land. So this will be something that will be very important as we move into the future and start to lose arable land um, around the planet and our population goes up. I suspect that this will be one of the most important strategies for dealing with that relationship of decreasing number of arable land acres and increasing population of the planet. And this isn't pie in the sky stuff. The uh, United States Navy was doing this um, in the 50s in the, in the um, uh, Pacific where their supply lines for supplying their troops um, uh, with food were stretched so they, start, they set up um, uh, in the Philippines um, various uh, warehouses where they grew food hydroponically. Very efficient, the technology is there, we know how to do it. Um, what Gordon came up with though, was a very interesting, intriguing strategy where you integrate the production of food with, the, with your processing of um, uh, black water waste to provide uh, nutrients and energy um, so that you're not wasting anything. Um, it makes for an extremely efficient system of food production. So the fourth one that we are exploring is the modularization and CIT integration of key infrastructure systems. What does that mean? And first of all, why? Um, well, first of all, um, the uh, key infrastructure systems are electrical systems uh, and uh, waste systems and water systems. And uh, back in Toronto on August 14, 2003, and across the Northeast United States and parts of Quebec, uh, was plunged into darkness for about, I think, three, five days, somewhere in that order. One of the largest power outages in the history of North America. Uh, 10 million people in Canada affected, 45 million people in the United States affected. Um, and what it, what it spoke to is the fragility of our um, North American, or at least uh, American Canadian power grids. Um, and how you can have one small incident happen uh, in one city and have a cascading series of failures. Um, so I think um, building resilience into our, our grids is going to be very important. Um, there are some opportunities for doing this. As another example just recently in the United States of storms cu um, um, cutting through a number of communities and taking out power. Um, so how will those communities respond and are they resilient to that kind of um, uh, impact. So how are we going to do it? Well, first of all, one thing to keep in mind um, in all of our discussions is Moore's Law. Uh, Gordon Moore was one of the founders of Intel, and he um, started to see over the years that as they developed technology that it was following a exponential path of um, efficiency in terms of how many integrated circuits you could put on a square inch of chip. Um, and basically, the number of uh, circuits you could put on uh, doubled um, every two years. Um, so that's an exponential growth. And a lot of other things in our technical economy are following the same power rule. Our world right now, our technical world, world is an exponential world. So typically, human beings tend to think arithmetically. When you think, I'm going to walk 10 steps, you know that in 10 steps I'm going to be here, but 10 steps exponentially, I'm going to be over there. But our minds tend to think um, arithmetically. This is very important because it starts to speak at how fast changes will happen, both positive changes and potentially negative changes. Has anyone seen this image before? Yep, it's um, Facebook. Facebook was founded in, in 2004. Today it has 8 million 800 million subscribers. That, that picture is a map of the light is all the dots, individual dots of white of, of people connecting to Facebook. And you can see that it maps out the United States and a little bit of the bottom of Canada because Canada is really just a thin ribbon along the, the, the top of the United States and the edge of um, 
Central and South America, Europe, a bit of the edges of Africa, and then into, China's almost gone uh, because, of course, it's cut off from the rest of the internet. Uh, but the, the point of showing you this is to say how fast technology is growing in its acceptance and also um, how it integrates itself into our lives. How many people aren't on Facebook? Well, you won't, probably won't put up your hands anyway. Um, so, so that's interesting. That's the Internet. Anyone heard of the Internet of Things? The Internet of Things is sort of the next bizarre step in connectivity. The Internet of Things is the connection of various things to one another, communicating through Wi-Fi with one another, and God knows for what purpose um, and, and why, but just like the inter Internet, it had a very simple purpose, and, and today it's about Facebook. Um, but here's how, it's how things will connect. This is a radio frequency identification device. Um, you pass a scanner over it, and that little wee chip there that's just larger than the size of a grain of rice, you can see it. And that's the palm of a hand there, and that little white thing is a grain of rice. Um, these things, when you pass a scanner over them, a little electromagnetic radi radiation um, shines down on it. it lights it up and it says, I'm a little RFID that is about um, uh, the door of the car closing. Who knows? But in, say, five or ten years, these things will actually have a little computer chip in them and they'll be communicating with other things so that maybe it's in my clothing or maybe it's um, in chairs or cars or whatever. And as things connect to one another, they'll be telling each other that they're there. I walk into a building, 20 of us walk into a room, and all of a sudden the room knows we're there and it can adjust the, the temperature of the room. So that's just my sort of prediction off the top of my head. But imagine the things that we haven't thought that these are doing. A lot of people are actually quite um, worried about the kind of uh, control and security um, uh, issues associated with these. But nevertheless, worry or not, it's happening, it's coming. So how does this have to do with resilience of cities? Well, one thing it has to do with um, resilience of cities is that we talk about smart grids, and this is a typical network diagram of smart grid that um, uh, industry with power generation sources and uh, that could contribute to the grid, uh, uh, solar power, wind power, hydropower, nuclear power, whatever, feeding onto the grid, connecting together in a way that makes sense. It, a way that says, I've got some extra su supply of power here, I can supply into the grid, I need some power, and so you've got all of those things connecting to one another. Well, that's, a, that's pretty straightforward. I mean, it's, it's not straightforward to implement, but that's, that's a basic understanding. But what, what about a grid that is the internet of all things? When you start to um, understand that it could be more than that, it could also be about how much food is being consumed. With, with RFID, you could know that so many bushels of tomatoes were, were, were um, being processed. You actually know that now through scanning at, at the checkout. And that could feed into the amount of uh, understanding what kind of sewage was being produced and the amount of water required and um, what kind of power was required for that. So all of these things can start to be integrated. And why this is important to think about is A, the cost for doing this is coming down exponentially. Um, the actual availability of this technology is increasing exponentially. And it poses the opportunity to create resilience in our systems that will allow systems, remember I talked about be de being decentralized and being flexible? Well, what happens if part of a system collapses or, or is affected by um, some sort of stress or shock? Another part of the system may be able, able to pick up um, uh, for that piece that is, is affected. Um, and then the other um, uh, aspect of looking at our, our infrastructure um, being more resilient is modularization. And this is a diagram that uh, uh, we drew for a, a resilience strategy that the city of Edmonton asked us to prepare for them, which was how do they make their city more resilient with existing technology? How am I doing for time? Three minutes. Um, but modularization meaning if, if something, uh, if, if you modularize power and waste and water supply, if one area of the city is affected, the other areas aren't affected and they can help that area that is affected. Infrastructure hardening, why? Well, so what happens when this, well, this is Katrina, um, or this um, hits this, or this? Well, you're going to get this, as you know, 
or you're going to get this. Um, and the frequency of weather events is increasing. Um, when I went into architecture school in 1980, there were four of them in the world. Um, when I uh, gave my first presentation on resilience in 2008, there were 40. The number and intensity of severe weather events is increasing. So we have to start to look at how we're going to build um, uh, or, or harden our infrastructure to that. And how are we doing it? Well, one is physical infrastructure hardening. For example, look at what they're doing right now in New Orleans um, with the new dike systems. Um, we can learn from the past. I mean, lessons about how to build um, a building fabric in a resilient way is key. Um, currently, we're going to have to look at more sophisticated techniques for um, hardening buildings, integrated durability buildings are created of many different parts and how they integrate will be important. And then learning from the present. We are dealing with, for example, um, uh, greater possibility of wind storms and, and, and water storms. We now start to, when we're designing, model these and actually take them into account and build resilience in the fabric as we go. For example, building uh, additional weather protection for existing buildings or new buildings. There's, there's some shuttering devices that we're um, exploring. So summary, um, key opportunities for building resilience, public health, education and training, governance, economy, justice, building fabric transportation, energy infrastructure, food production infrastructure, CIT infrastructure, and water and waste infrastructure. And the five approaches, increase urban size and density, probably the most important one, low carbon energy production, low local urban food production, modularization, and integration of CIT infrastructure and infrastructure building and fabric hardening. That's it.